I welcome you all to worship this morning. It's good to see you here today. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, Wednesday, yes, we will be continuing our Bible study. We did finish the book of Joshua. We're going to start up looking at the book of Judges. Thursday this week, 5.30 p.m., Crafters, Inc., uh, that will be drawing. Uh, there may not be a, a great finished product that anyone would want to hang on to, but I'm going to uh, show a few tricks and how to, to draw things so that you have a, a really good expectation that you're going to have at the end of your work something worth keeping and some lessons on how to draw perspectives, create depth and volume. Yes. Oh, that thing. Well, I hope it's going to be fun. We have fun whether it looks like anything or not. I'm sorry. There are no mistakes in creating the best That's right. There's only individualism. Well, I guess there's something to that. You can say there's... Opportunities for development. It's all, it's all creative, but when... The whole idea behind technique, I guess, though, is that there is a right way to do it. Right way to, to draw a room and create depth, and a good way to make a crooked one that looks like an impressionist nightmare. Next Sunday, February the 13th, there'll be a church board uh, business meeting after the service at 11.45 a.m. And Tuesday, February 13th, 9.30 a.m., UMW meeting. And February 14th, two things at least going on. That's Valentine's Day, and as I said last week, for those who are getting to the close of the day and should have but did not do anything for Valentine's Day, you can come here and repent in dust and ashes at 6 p.m. And after we're done here in the sanctuary, we'll go across the, the way for a regular time of Bible fellowship. A little further down the road, February 17th, the Northwest Texas Conference and Amarillo District are having a UMW Leadership Development Day. That'll be at St. Paul UMC in Amarillo. And naturally, having had Ash Wednesday, we'll be beginning the season of Lent, last six Sundays. Saturday, March 10th, uh, the Rita Wynn will present a presentation on missionary conferences, say a little bit about where the UMW dollars are spent. And also, there'll be a special offering on that following Sunday, which will be UM Sunday for UMCOR. If you're not familiar with that, that's a special offering we take throughout the church that basically pays for all of the administrative expenses uh, in order to make sure that the dollars that are donated for various causes go 100% to those causes. Uh, UMCOR has a good rating on the charity websites that rate it. If you notice, it only spends about 5% on administrative costs. But even that's slightly inaccurate. They just look at the dollars spent in administration versus dollars in aid, and they don't take into account the fact that that money was specifically given for administration. And that's so that we can assure people that whenever they give to one of, the, um, one of those numbered uh, causes that they have on the UMCOR site, you should check it out and look into some of them, that the people who give that money know that 100% of it is going to help the people it is meant to help. This year's Palm Sunday is going to be on March 25th, and Easter will be on April the 1st. And again, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to worship. I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds as we listen to the prelude together. Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is He Has Made Me Glad. 
It's in your black book on page 2270. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing the verse and then we'll, the, in the chorus, and then we'll repeat the chorus. you to join me in our call to worship this morning, taken from Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even the youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our first hymn of praise is O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing in your red book, page 57. We'll sing the first five verses and then verse 7.
time of prayer this morning, I ask if any of you have any joys or any concerns that you'd like to share so that we could take them before God together in prayer. Yes, Lee. Oh, I would, I mean, there is no other way that I would be as well off as I am if I wasn't a child of God. How many people's houses burn down? But there's time that all of their clothes are brought out, all of their medicines are brought out, all of, most of the office materials, because I'm in the midst of doing taxes. <laughs> my clients brought their paperwork the day before the fire. But I put it in my office where the door was closed. So that was the least damaged room. Plus, my filing cabinet was out front, but it was uh, it's damaged on the outside, but everything's fine on the inside. And all of the people that came, and your pastor and my pastor were one of them, he made sure that my, he, he looked at my desk there, and he knew what I was doing because it was messy, and that was probably the current work I was doing. And he was helping with that, and he got my computer out for me, and the keyboard, and the, everything else. And uh, even my chair <laughs> got out. And those firemen, they got out as much as they could. And I'm glad they did, because there was a second fire two hours later. And it that's when it damaged my bedroom, and the roof caved in, and the bathroom, and I, it's, you know, it's not pretty. But God is good, and I, all the time. And I had written that on my little bulletin board that was on my refrigerator just a couple of days before. I'd taken my little red pen there and written, God is good, all the time. On your refrigerator a couple of days before? Yeah, I, yeah, I have a magnetic board that when the kids lived there, we wrote notes to each other. Well, I went, I don't know, it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and there was nothing on it, so I thought, I need to write something. So I thought, okay, God is good, all the time. And that was on there. And uh, you know, no one got injured. Well, my my cat died. Charlie. Charlie died. Yeah. But Barry said that he wasn't burned. He was <clears throat> just smoked. <coughs> and you know, I do need a place to go. But I'm going to tell you, Georgine is such a gracious hostess. I mean, she. I'm taking over one of her bedrooms and one of her bathrooms, and um, we've been able to have good conversation <coughs> at night. And I can see God's hand in this also because she went through a grave loss last year. And she explained to me, she said to me, this is the same thing that you're going through. And so I've been able to listen to the wisdom of somebody. Well, well how, who else would God have put me with? Do you all see what I'm talking about? <coughs> Miracles every day. And I just have to praise this. Thank you for everybody who's called and helped, and it's amazing. I People that I don't even know, the lady at Route 66, 
cleaners, she's going to come and get all my clothes tomorrow because they do smell like smoke. Get all of my clothes and take them and clean them and for nothing. And then the pizza owner bought us pizza Friday night, and Georgine. And, you know, I mean, just so many little things that add up to be big things. And I was amazed because I was talking with my daughter a little while ago and said, man, when I have a funeral, you might just have it out in the cemetery because there's not going to be very many people there. <laughs> well, I don't even know I have been assisting. So, as I said, God is good. All, All the time. time. All the time. God is good. Right. Ron? <clears throat> Just about there on my sister Diane. Uh, that, that other guy, the doctor she went to, 99% sure that that spot on her femur is not cancer. So they're here wrong. If they do surgery, they'll do it now, put a plate in it, with screws, and they're trying to see if it gets better on its own. So, anyways, good news. Amen. Any more joys or concerns this morning? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks this morning that you are tireless, inexhaustible, and that at the moments when we feel exhausted, when it seems that there's more coming at us than we can handle. You've given us your promise that you shall renew our strength, that we will mount up with wings like eagles, that we can run and not be weary and walk and not faint. We give you thanks this morning, particularly for all the wings that you sent to help lift up Lee in this uh, time of loss the people that she didn't even know she knew or knew her, the people at the pizza place, at the cleaners, the friends who have come around her for Georgine. There are times in all of our lives where it seems as though a huge chunk of that life is taken away. And we wonder what we are going to do. And when we don't see exactly what the future holds, perhaps as you inspired Lee to think a few days ago, we can fill our hearts with the reminder that you are good all the time and in all things. We pray this morning um, for Julia. We would ask that you would quickly bring her back to full steam we pray, uh, continue to pray and to thank you for Diane. We hope that her surgery goes smoothly. We're thankful at the doctor's news that it was not cancer. This morning, for these people mentioned and for us, we ask that you would fill our hearts with the full measure of hope that is ours in you through Jesus Christ, so that we can live each day as faithful children of an always faithful God. Help us wrangle those wild thoughts and bring them into alignment with Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, he didn't make that his focus or make a big deal of it, but emptied himself, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. With humble and joyful gratitude, we thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness, for your mercy, which is new every morning, and for your grace, which is sufficient each and every day. We thank you for your abiding presence, your unfailing love, and your gift of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. It's page 474 in the red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all three verses. see your hand every day all around us. Thank you for all the ways that you reach out to us to hold us up and to lift us up and to lead us home. Now, Lord, open, open our, our minds hearts and minds, minds by the by power, power of your of Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit that, that as the scriptures, scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you, what you say, say to, to us today. today. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle reading this morning is 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For I do this of my own will. I have a reward, but not of my own will. I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights of the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Our gospel reading is Mark 1, 29-39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. 
He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many of those who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let's go to the neighboring, neighboring town so that I might proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people to God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The focus in uh, today's message in this Rise Up series is on focus. I was just talking with a friend this last week who uh, still does creative writing and suggested maybe I should try to do a short story. And it made me think of all the third finished or half finished novels that I had. And he asked me, why did you stop that? I said, well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I'd learned enough about literature at college to realize that my books were too preachy. They were bad art because I just couldn't stop talking about faith, about God. They were just too preachy. And I suppose that's one way of saying how I went from there to here was somebody brought that into focus, this aspect of me that I just was never going to be able to shake. And Jesus is talking about a focus here where he says, for this reason I came, to proclaim the gospel, not just here, but all around. He had a good day the day before. He cast out an unclean spirit. People were very impressed. They were coming to him with all their problems. All the experts suddenly didn't know anything. I mean, why go to anyone else when you've got one person who just seems to bat a thousand? And it probably wouldn't have been long before Jesus was having people wake him up in the morning saying, Jesus, my cow has a cough. Could you come take a look at it? They were just investing in him and starting to crowd him with all of their needs and their wants and desires to just fix everything for them. But he wouldn't be distracted by that. He even, in a way, doesn't answer Peter's question, which isn't a question. Everybody's looking for you. Is he thinking, what are you doing here? Praying? Charging up? Why aren't you over here answering all these people's demanding concerns? He doesn't let himself get distracted with all that stuff. He says, no, I came to proclaim the gospel, but not just proclaim. God's word is different than our words. He's not just a talking head. He's doing it. He's, while he's preaching it, people who watch him can see him doing it. He's uh, casting out the unclean spirits. He has dominion over the spiritual world. From last week, I pointed out that that was kind of the nature of an unclean spirit. Anything that says, what have we to do with you? And certainly there's a, a lot of thought out there that says, well, God's largely irrelevant just for Sundays, sort of a cottage industry for a few people, or maybe they'll even quote Nietzsche, who said, God is dead. There's always the smart aleck that says, well, I guess that should be the epitaph on Nietzsche's tombstone. Nietzsche is dead, said God. But God isn't irrelevant, and God isn't out to get us or take something away from us. That was another thing the unclean spirit thought. God's come to destroy them. He just cast them out. His purpose was that he came that we would have life and have it abundantly. Yeah, he's healing diseases and he's feeding the hungry, and that shows a sort of a, a physical and material dominion. He's king over that, too. Peter will later see that he's king over the wind and the waves, even they're going to obey him. The feeding of the 5,000. Its message, though, wasn't really, you'll always have something to eat, but I think more fundamentally that when you trust God, when you're about going about God's work, 
when you entrust what you have to God's hands, they'll not just be enough, but they'll actually be plenty. God gives us what we need for material life. And as the psalmist says, he can put a new and right spirit in us and drive out the bad spirits, the spirits of fear, the spirits of anger, the spirits of hatred, the spirits of hopelessness. There's something else Jesus says in Mark 2 about why he came to proclaim and enact and show the kingdom. He says, whoever wishes to be first among you must be the servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's not the usual word for serve, like serve as a slave or a servant, just to be a busybody or a dog's body. This word is diakonia, it's where we get deacon, and it comes from that incident in Acts where they had to appoint people to take the daily rations of food or amount of food that was appointed for the widows and the orphans and to distribute it fairly. That's where we get deacons, and it does often refer to service in the terms of serving to people. In the Gospel of Mark, it's used about four times. It's used once at the end of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, where the angels came and ministered to him or served him. He was hungry. Maybe they literally brought him food, like Isaiah, or Elijah, rather, was fed by the ravens. It's also used of Peter's mother here in this passage when it says she immediately got up and went and served them. It's also used of the women uh, who followed Jesus around. It said they would minister to him and his disciples. And that's been a sort of a trend in the Christian church throughout the ages. We read of Dorcas in the book of Acts. She was a woman who had died, and everybody was torn up about it, and Peter came and actually raised her from the dead. When Peter arrived, they showed her all the clothes that she would make for the poor. Everybody was so torn up about it. And early Christians were noted for ministering to the sick, not necessarily healing them, but actually going out and taking care of the sick when the pagans were terrified of them. They knew as well as we do that if you stay around sick people, you yourself get sick. The Christians went in and took care of them when no one else would. But what is the service focused on? When Jesus talks about ministering, serving, what is it actually focused on? When Jesus comes and he... uh, to Peter's home. Remember, they've just been to the synagogue. Maybe they've had another eventful day, but it's sort of like us. Synagogue happens in the morning. Um, It's much longer than we would have. They would read the scriptures, somebody would, and somebody would talk about it. And then around lunchtime, they would all get out and they would want to go and have their lunch. So they show up at Peter's house for their, for what for us would be the Sunday after worship meal. And his mother's sick. And I wonder in the scene if Peter's thinking, oh, gosh, I mean, we're famished. We just got out of church. It's time to eat. Jesus, will you go get mom and tell her to make us something to eat? She's going to be like, oh, oh, okay, but I think I'll heal her first. We don't want to get her germs. This ministry of food is important, and it's, it's still important. But it's something that we should connect with today, and I don't know if you've done it in your heads already, But this idea of ministering a food service, this is what the connection is. That verb for to serve, to give people what they really need, the nourishment they need to survive. Jesus is saying that spiritual nourishment that you can't get anywhere else, that the world can't give to you, that no amount of just regular old knowledge will give you, the answers that you want out of your life, I can give them to you, but first... I have to lay down my life and take it up again. My body broken for you, my blood shed for you, and many for the forgiveness of sins. This was the culmination of what Jesus has been doing all along in proclaiming the good news and also enacting it. His focus never shifted, never wavered, never weakened. His purpose was this to show us the kingdom, 
to invite us to be a part of it, to provide a way into it, and to give us the tools to work and serve within it. And we ought, like little children in their games imitating grown-up activities, be eager to enter that world and to become fruitful and working within it. But what do we focus on in whatever we do? The question of focus is very interesting. Different people will look at the world and see it in different ways, depending on the way their mind works. One particularly interesting example I came across, I've modified it somewhat, is a test that was administered to children. They would give them a golf ball, a baseball bat, a golf club, and a baseball. And they would ask them to sort these objects into two boxes. Now, as you might imagine, many children and most people would admit to sorting them this way. There's a certain logic to it. The balls are the objects that go from place to place. They get struck. They're the ways that go in the hoops or go over the fence. And then you have the instruments that you use to strike them. They're both, in a way, structural, looking at the round things or the long things, but they're also functional. It does address the purpose of them. One is just to move and to bounce. The other is to strike and to add force. But other children will sort them a little differently. They'll actually put the baseball bat with the baseball and the golf ball with the golf club. Uh, if they come up with neither of those solutions, you think mm, maybe something else is going on there. But they're not just looking at what's in front of them piecemeal. And they don't just understand the purpose of the objects. They understand the larger picture, the game that's being played with them. They see a larger purpose, not just a mechanical or a functional or a day-to-day -day use, but a meaningful one, a game that's full of rules, of structure, where you can actually win or lose. The reason I brought this list up is I want to give you another list that's kind of interesting. On this list, we have science, magic, technology, and religion. Now, if you ask people to separate those into two categories, what do you think they're going to do? A significant number of people will divide them this way. Science and technology on one side, magic and religion on the other. Doesn't that seem to make sense? I mean, science and technology, it's the empirical. It's what we can see. Some people would classify it as the material versus the spiritual, but quite a few would also categorize it as part of it being uh, the real and part of it being the imaginary. But that's not the way that I would separate it. Science and religion go together, and magic and technology go together. This was an amazing insight uh, that C.S. Lewis had, and I've been thinking about it for quite a long time, but I want to share it with you again. He says, for the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality, and the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. For magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. The solution is a technique. I'll put it in a little diagrammatic form so you can kind of see it more clearly laid out. But that's interesting. Look at the shift in the cardinal problem. It used to be, and it was, and it wasn't just in Christian Europe, it would be true of people in Confucianist China, it would be true of Buddhists, it would be true of everybody everywhere. They were trying to discover the full truth about the world, the material sp truth, the spiritual truth, and then conform their lives to it. Whereas we no longer even worry about that. I say we in a general sense, in a social sense. Most people are just more concerned with figuring out how to solve problems, how to make things better. They'll never explain to you how they came up with the idea of what's better and what's worse. It's like 
the difference between the bats to the clubs, in one way it doesn't matter how you separate them, you have to ask the question, what game is being played? What's really in focus? Last week I described briefly why science really can't come up with any answers to any of the important questions. Because it is just looking at inorganic stuff. When we come to the actual human realm of thoughts, feelings, judgments, ideas like justice and mercy, at some level science is going to have to come back and tell us those are perceptual illusions. That does a lot less damage than you think because most people simply can't believe it we're immediately presented with the reality of who we are as beings. But nevertheless, those questions are still there and there's no tools available to answer them. And in fact, fewer and fewer people are even thinking it's worth trying. So why do so many seem satisfied with that scientific way of seeing the world? I think it's because they don't really care about any game except the one they want to play. In terms of the cardinal problem that C.S. Lewis um, described, our cardinal problem would be how to conform ourselves to the world. We actually want to know what's real, how it works, so we don't make any dumb mistakes, any blunders. And it's really nice to have things like central heating, air conditioning, and computers. But in terms of those larger questions, that's why we have religion all over the world, and what Christianity offers in particular as a means to conform our minds to the mind of God and our wills to the will of God. We should be careful though in looking at this list because religion can be a lot like magic for some people. If religion becomes about getting what we want out of life or even making ourselves into the people that we would like to be, if it's a self-improvement project, then it becomes like a tool in technology's box, a way of changing the world or ourselves to get what we want. But that's not the game certainly that Jesus was playing. That wasn't the work that he went around doing. He wasn't there just to heal people or cast out demons. That was to show forth the kingdom of God that he was proclaiming. Jesus healed the sick, but that's not why he came. He did feed the hungry, it's not why he came. He ate with sinners, with people of all types, taught people how to get along. Doesn't everyone all want to get along? Still not why he came. He came to show us the kingdom, to invite us to be a part of it, to provide a way into it, and give us the tools to work and serve within it. Paul did the same thing. He's writing to the Corinthians here in a letter. We're reading one part of it. But remember what happens in Corinthians 13? After all this talk where he's telling them, yes, yes, we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, love edifies. And when he gets to 13, he's going to say, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. We can only get glimpses into what the Corinthians thought they were doing. Uh, they seem to be emphasizing spiritual gifts, making a lot of noise when they were together, speaking in tongues so much that some people expressed the concern that others thought they were out of their minds or that no one was actually being edified. They weren't hearing anything that they could understand. And Paul says in a 1 Corinthians 8.1, I'll read the full passage here. Just Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge or does not know anything yet as they ought to. But anyone who loves God is known by him. We're all looking for a place in the world. So in some sense, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror all the time, trying to figure out not just who we are in terms of the environment, who we are in terms of our job, who other people think we are, but who we think we are. And Paul just kind of dismisses all that with one point. He says, God knows me. And so he becomes willing to give up who he is. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To those not under the law, became as those not under the law. 
He mentions he's still subject to the law of Christ. He really isn't willing to, as Emerson said, insist upon yourself, accept no imitations. I remember reading that in high school. It sounded very independent, it sounded very grown up, insist upon yourself. Paul never insisted upon himself. And he goes through a long list of claims that he just gave up so that he could preach the gospel freely. He could announce the kingdom. He could do the work that God came to do in Christ and God appointed him to continue in bringing that good news to others. He refused to, insi to insist on himself. And this isn't fakery, this is adaptation. He can make himself interested in what other people are interested in. Have you ever met somebody who had the ability to just start a conversation and suddenly make you feel like you were the most interesting person in the world? To hear what you had to say and say, wow. And then suddenly after about a few minutes you thought, wow, maybe my job isn't so boring. I'm, I'm actually doing something pretty cool. Paul would do that, I think. He would, he would meet people where they were at, find out what they were interested in, and at least just from a polite standpoint, show that he was willing to listen to them and care about them, and then so naturally, maybe they'll give him a listen, and they'll care about the message that he has for them. See, the thing about being a good person or trying to be the person... Uh, that's acceptable. Some people might look to society to give them those values. Some people might look to abstract principles. But everybody wants to be a good person. Nobody wants to be worthless. So everyone you meet has spent maybe their entire lives, but certainly a great deal of time, effort, toil, sweat, and tears to get to the point of where they are. So in any instance, standing maybe slightly aloof, or saying from a distance, hey, you should come over here. You don't realize it, but your life is worthless. Without God, it's all a waste. We'll be here waiting for you when you decide to change your mind. So not surprisingly, that doesn't work. And I'd seriously doubt that that was Paul's approach. Forgetting about the apple in the mirror for a moment, I kind of like that one before I describe it. I want to suggest another analogy. If you were, imagine yourself at baptism, you were put into really hot water. And after a while, somebody came back and there was nothing left but paper fragments in the hot water and you just had a clear glass jar. There were no labels left. They were all gone. Now God could pour in whatever God wanted. There was one time, Priscilla, you had a perfectly good container to take the tea over to the Thanksgiving feast, but it was still clearly labeled Clorox. I thought, people are going to freak out. It's perfectly clean, perfectly safe, but I said, no, let's find something else. It matters what labels people wear, and that's kind of the state most people are in. They want to put a label on themselves. It doesn't matter what it is. It could come from their career, their family, their education, their value system, even their political party. And Paul is willing to kind of wear that label for a little while. Because these are people that are like empty ketchup bottles and mustard bottles going around the world or looking at God saying, please fill me with ketchup or mustard. And Paul knows that he can go ahead and wear those labels for a little while because he's already been filled with what he really wanted and didn't know it. He's already filled to overflowing with the love of God. When we look at a mirror, and I like this apple in front of the mirror picture, because I imagine an apple eaten up in some way, it's always gonna be who we are. And then in that perfect reflection, it's how we want to be seen. And I kind of call this the mirror of self-esteem because some people believe their own press. They actually think they're all that. And they're gonna be proud, boastful, arrogant people. Others will have some image in the mirror of either what they want to be or they want other people to think they are. And inside they're gonna know they're never gonna live up to it and they're gonna be eaten up on the inside. And that's kind of the, the way the world works, like a bunch of bottles 
still wearing old labels that'll never satisfy, looking for a way to fill them up. But there's, of course, another approach that Paul has already encountered. And he agrees with that assessment. He sees himself and the world sees him as an apple that's being eaten up, going from place to place, homeless, disrespected, beaten, in shipwrecks, not even respected by the Corinthian church that he founded, doesn't matter, doesn't bother him. Because through the mirror, which in fact is the mirror of Christ, he understands what God sees. And that's enough for him. He is known by God, that's enough for him. He's known by the one who created him who says, I'm going to bring you to perfection. I'm going to bring you to be with me. I'm with you, it's enough for him. But he also has the love of God and he wants other people to stand in front of that mirror. He wants to see other people the way God sees them. Not according to the labels they have, he knows that's nothing. The real problem is their emptiness. The fact that they, they lack that knowledge of God's love. And he takes it in a way even further because in a way, one way or the other, that's who we are. Either time will make us that way, or suffering. Eventually, we're gonna be like an apple eaten up. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we're afflicted, he's talking about himself and the other evangelists, in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. In 1 Corinthians 15.30, he famously says, I die every day. Because it's true that even though that's who we are, that eaten up apple, it's also true that the perfect apple, the apple of God's eye, is also who we are. And in fact, this is one of the mysteries, one of the seeming contradictions of who Jesus was. Because he was crucified like an apple eaten up. He gave everything he had to give us what we needed but at the same time, because he did that, because he became humble, because he had a servant's heart, because he communicated the love of God, therefore he, God also highly exalted him so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul meant what he said when he said, well, death is at work in us so that life may be in you. Our lives are all sometimes a mixture of that. Sometimes we, we, we're going to suffer one way or the other, but in the way that we meet troubles in life and the degree to which we can continue giving ourselves for others, convincing them, showing them how God sees them and how God loves them, even though we're eaten up on the outside or we have loss inside, we're renewed day by day. But for those of the church and to Corinth where he was writing, he really meant it too in another sense. You don't have to go around and be persecuted and beaten up. That's not your calling. I'm here to go from place to place and try to convince people about the good news who may very well break my jaw for it. But you, you are in your community. You're free to love one another, to care for one another. Yes, to serve one another, to build one another up to be in that community like a light before the world, to be such a people that when they compare that with their families, when they compare that with what they had hoped to have in their relationships, they're gonna be thinking, I'm missing out. I gotta hear more about this. One of my favorite verses from that very passage where Paul says, I die every day or I die daily is the end when it's 1 Corinthians 58 where he says, therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. 
That was actually a, a verse that was given to me when I uh, joined a church for a couple of years when I was between college before I went back. And the minister said, I don't know why, it just kept popping into my head when I was praying about you. He said he was praying for all the people who were joining. And it stuck with me because there are times, and I'm sure there's times for you too, although it might not be as much of a crisis, when I wonder what is the point? It seems like you're always presenting a message nobody seems to ever believe. But the message is for me was that I was just thinking about myself. I was still looking in the wrong mirror. If whether or not I'm fruitful by my own measures isn't really what's important. What was really important for me was knowing that I understood the love of God and that I could always work to show it to other people, to help other people see it in everything I did. How I reacted to trouble, how I reacted to stress, just whether I paid attention to them, that's what I'm still struggling with. I'm somebody who gets lost in their head. I had somebody at seminary who thought I was a complete jerk because she said hello to me and, and I, I wouldn't answer and I tried to explain, well, I didn't hear you. When I'm in a class, I think so much that I come out and I actually I literally can't hear people. People who know me will actually know that you need to come up and sometimes don't punch me in the face, but do something to get my attention. But there can, I mean, there is a lot of work involved in trying to understand in terms of my life and, and, it, and because I see, I've seen how uniquely it applies to all the different things I've been through and my personality, I know it's gonna to be tough for everyone. It's gonna be a lot of hard work to figure out, okay, how, how does that fit into my life? How do I not only find peace in being loved by God, but how do I see other people that way? That reduces your stress level immediately, I'll tell you, because big source of stress is usually all the other idiots in the world. If you can stop seeing them as idiots and see them as way, the way God does, that's gonna bring your stress level down a lot. And the other thing is to so treat them in a way that they begin to consider maybe I can believe that God sees me that way. And maybe I can begin to understand what the gospel was about. That not only does it make sense that God would do something like Jesus did in order to make sure that I understood the kingdom and saw what it was, that I was enabled to enter into it, and to understand through repeatedly uh, observing this, this Eucharist, this Thanksgiving, that the Christ who died for me on the cross is now exalted in heaven and will surely give me as much as all I need now as he did then. When I'm engaged on the weak work of the kingdom, when you're engaged on the work of the kingdom, there can be no doubt that God will give us the tools that we need to complete it. And for that, we can be truly thankful. And with that, I'm actually kind of looking forward to communion. So let's get to it. But first, uh, would the ushers please come forward and prepare to receive God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. Most holy God, as we offer our gifts today, remind us why we are giving them. Help us not to insist upon ourselves, but to see our lives as part of what you're doing in the world. Help us not even to insist on you. Jesus was humble and lowly in heart, but to insist instead upon your love toward all whom we meet. Help us help them to see it to believe it, and to become a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Professor. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You'll find the responses to the great thanksgiving on page 13 of the Red Hymnals. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty Father. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, power Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to announce that the time would come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave, broke, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break 
is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The Lord is invited. The table is prepared. Come forward and give thanks and receive.
Our hymn of dedication is Hymn of Promise, page 707 in your red hymnal. We'll see all three verses. After the benediction, our response will be on Eagle's Wings, page 143 in your red hymnal. Please stand. <laughs> sticking to it, who makes us a part of it, and who gives us the win through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you to shine. 